Thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to thank you all for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And thank you all for attending and for tuning in uh, at home. And this project is based on um, a book length research project that I'm working on that deals with um, the ways the, the Flint sit down strikes in Michigan uh, energized conservative politics during the Great Depression, um, an era that's typically known for the upsurge of New Deal liberalism uh, during that particular decade. And what my project looks at is how um, public um, outcry against the sit downs shaped a conservative revival um, in Michigan at the time. If there's a broad question I think I'm really interested in, it's this question of where do our political feelings come from? Um, I think in today's political culture in the United States, we think of our political beliefs as something that are very, both very personal and very passionate. Um, but what I think is really, really interesting um, as a historian is how institutions in our society um, so often work to shape what are people's political beliefs. And in particular during the Great Depression, it's an interesting case for looking at this because faced with workers who are becoming intensely passionate about organizing labor unions in their workplace, um, they are becoming more and more supportive of President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the various forms of legislation that made up the New Deal um, during the 1930s. What, for example, companies are trying to do is to mold um, worker political beliefs into forms and shapes that they find more acceptable. And during the 1930s in the automobile industry, for example, at General Motors, when they're faced with this sit-down strike crisis, General Motors' response to this is to somehow find ways to mold these militant workers and those who would be their supporters into conservative workers. Um, and I think the era of the sit-down strikes in 1936, 1937, very powerfully illustrates how business leaders were very unsettled and uncomfortable with workers determining their own political beliefs and they begin to explore um, a lot of ways to mold workers back into um, political beings that they could more easily accept. At the heart of uh, this effort at General Motors during the Flint sit-down strike crisis, which begins in December 30th, 1936, is a company-sponsored organization that would actually be frequently um, mocked by workers and union officials themselves, which was called the Flint Alliance. Um, its full name was the Flint Alliance for the Security of Our Jobs, Our Homes, and Our Community. And this organization was intended as a kind of antidote to the United Automobile Workers organizing upsurge that was happening in the GM plants in late 36 and into early 1937. So what General Motors wanted to do was to create something like a social movement that would be a kind of home for conservative anti-union workers. And this was, at the time, widely panned as a very clumsy, awkward effort that enjoyed very little support. But instead of viewing this organization as other historians have suggested, that it was a kind of carnival sideshow um, that was dismissed by most workers, um, I think there's um, important components of significance um, to what was going on with the Flint Alliance. Um, there were workers who supported it, and even those who didn't enthusiastically supported it were forcibly brought into its orbit and thus part of, in a way, this conservative movement. It was the brainchild of two men. Um, firstly, um, a GM auto worker in Flint named Paul Loisel, uh, who was in his early 30s. And according to um, a kind of biography of him that the Chicago Tribune published, it wasn't published in a Michigan paper, but Paul Loisel was this disgruntled GM worker who was so disgusted by the United Automobile Workers organizing drive in the plant that he had reportedly even been busted by the company for his outspoken beliefs against the union, dis his disruptive views in the workplace about the union. 
And so he began supposedly to canvas Flint for support for what he called an anti-union organization. And this led him to a former GM executive, a former mayor of Flint, a kind of local political bigwig named George E. Boyson. Um, you see him in this photo in the middle under the sign there that says we object to minority rule. Um, if you look to Boyson's left, I can't confirm it, but I believe that is Paul Loisel uh, himself. And George Boyson becomes truly the founding father of the Flint Alliance. He's organizing its publicity, its newsletter. He is organizing rallies, hosting lectures. Um, he was disliked by many Flintians because people thought that um, he talked a lot, but there wasn't necessarily much substance there. But he becomes um, the central figure in this um, anti-union, pro-company kind of movement that GM is trying to build. And the Flint Alliance goes right away into the workplaces. Um, early on in January 1937, about a week into the sit-down strike, they begin um, gathering signatures on what were membership cards, um, circulating petitions in the workplace, for having workers sign these petitions um, so that they would be collected and sent, um, for example, to the governor's, uh, to the Capitol building uh, where Governor um, Frank Murphy works um, uh, in Lansing, Michigan. The, the membership cards were a, a key part of the statistical data that the Flint Alliance would put out there, like, oh, we have 12,000 members. But the, the kind of pitiful part of this is they would have anybody sign these things. Elementary school students would be asked to sign these things. Um, local farmers in Genesee County, Michigan would sign them. Oh, and then they would say to the New York Times, oh, look, we have 60,000 members. And then the union would say, well, of course, because you had everybody in Flint sign it, uh, even those who had never been near an auto plant. Um, they would organize um, very political statements, for example, um, having auto workers sign their names and put addresses and envelopes for form letters that would be sent to Franklin D. Roosevelt um, in Washington and sent to Governor Murphy, to Francis Perkins, the US Labor Secretary at the time. Um, workers didn't like all of this kind of fake um, artificial participation in these gestures. Some workers tried to avoid signing this. They would say, well, how can I sign something? They would pretend I don't understand or I don't feel comfortable signing this peti petition because I can't read it. So they would play dumb with, with the hope of avoiding having to actually participate in this um, kind of agit prop um, against um, the governor or against the president. They would also push workers to attend Flint Alliance rallies. Um, there's a, 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 a small kind of arena, a small kind of gymnasium um, in downtown Flint that GM owned. Um, and it was called for IMA Arena, the Industrial Mutual Association Arena. And um, Boyson would have these huge rallies and they would force the, the GM plants um, in southeastern Michigan to send their workers to attend this thing. Um, and um, workers recalled that they would be given um, the whole day off if they would agree to go to the Flint Alliance rally. And UAW supporters, um, for example, the labor newspapers were full of the very um, kind of nasty disses that they would put out there against the company and against George Boyson and the Flint Alliance. Um, they would talk about Boyson as a dead rat. They would um, uh, make very edgy, things about sexual innuendo uh, regarding these workers who would go along with um, uh, Boyson and the Flint Alliance. Uh, the UAW viewed it as this pitiful act um, that really hardly anyone in Flint supported. But uh, when we go beyond Genesee County um, into the other parts of the nationwide GM system, we find better support um, for the pro-company anti-union stand. In Flint, where workers had to deal with things on a regular basis, like having to do favors for foremen in exchange for jobs, 
um, or um, even having to pay foremen to get their jobs during the Depression, having to deal with speed up, having to deal with um, labor spies, one in three G employees in Flint was thought to be a labor spy. Um, in Flint, it was a hard sell, but beyond Flint, when um, the GM factories in Flint shut down, it stopped the entire GM system. And what happened was workers felt in other places like they hadn't been consulted when the, their colleagues in Flint went on strike. And they were resentful and embittered about it. So the loyalty committees elsewhere, like in uh, the GM Turnstead plant in Detroit or in Saginaw, or in Terrytown, New York, or even closer to here in um, Garrett County, Maryland, in Baltimore, Maryland, the Fisher Body Plant there, um, those loyalty committees were not really a sham, but rather became really um, centers where these anti-union workers found a voice and found a critical mass to push, push back against the union. <clears throat> And even beyond the auto industry, um, the sit-down strikes happening in Flint were not well received elsewhere. Um, one of my favorite um, incidents in Michigan that I came across in my research was a sit-in demonstration at a leather plant in Grand Haven, Michigan, um, near the coast of Lake Michigan, at a company called the Eagle Ottawa Leather Company. And here you have workers who were so determined, this is in February 1937, so determined that there would be no sit down in their plant, that they themselves occupied the factory to make sure no militant sit downer could get in and have a sit down strike. So they, these 300 workers, um, stayed in the plant 24 hours a day for at least three days to prevent the sit down. And they claimed to be a non union collective bargaining group in the plant. But what they did was, they would occupy the plant at night, they would sleep there so no one else could get in, and then they would work the next day. And the newspapers praised them for being not only opposed to the union, but so in love with their boss that they would continue to work the next day. Um, but that was covered in newspapers throughout the United States. Even the New York Times had two articles on the Eagle Ottawa demonstration. And then just as quickly it disappeared from the press. Um, my personal, um, one of my f other favorite cases is an event that occurred on January 29th, um, an anti-union demonstration led by Detroit Chevrolet workers um, who drove um, the hour and a half up uh, from Detroit to Lansing to occupy the office of Governor Frank Murphy um, at the Lansing Capitol building. Uh, and this January 29th demonstration is an important part of my research because I think it gives some very concrete dimensions to company claims that loyalty to the company and the anti-union view was not fake or forced or artificial, but was rather something genuine that came from the bottom up, from a kind of pro-company rank and file. And there was a 10 hour sit down in Governor Murphy's office um, according to the Michigan newspapers, uh, Detroit News, the Free Press, um, 71 men and women participated. Um, when they, they barged their way into the, the governor's office and uh, their main demand was that um, Governor Murphy would use the National Guard to forcibly end the sit down. And Murphy was totally nonplussed and very annoyed um, that these people had come to do this because he, like so many others in Michigan, thought of these demonstrations as company contrivances. Um, and he sarcastically said to the demonstrators, well, I'll, how about this, it's Friday, so I'll leave my um, office door open, you can stay the whole weekend if you want. You can sit down, make yourself comfortable, enjoy yourselves. But he refused to sort of give any legitimacy to this demonstration. Um, but this, like the Eagle Ottawa incident, was covered nationally throughout the United States. And um, they even, in the newspapers, they quote Murphy's sarcasm uh, as these people were very pushily saying to him, well, if you're gonna allow the workers at General Motors to sit down, we can sit down and occupy your office. And Murphy said, okay, sure, that's fine. You, I'll leave my door open. You can stay the whole weekend if you like. <laughs> um, 
there was a great deal of this pro-company, anti-union um, political demonstrating and organizing um, that was going on in January and February 1937. And historians who've talked about it have dismissed it as a kind of sideshow um, to the UAW's very principled upsurge in the auto plants. But the consequences of this politically for the union um, for Democrats, for union supporters in Michigan was incredibly negative. Um, public opinion in Michigan and beyond recoils from the sit-down strikes of the early 1930s. Um, this was a tactic, the occupation of these factories by union workers um, is described in the press as an epidemic, as a virus, as a craze. Um, people thought of it as communistic and socialistic um, deeds by unions, not as desperate depression era workers trying to get collective bargaining in their shops, but rather as a kind of mad power grab by tyrannical labor leaders who, who somehow must have been taking a page from Joseph Stalin in Russia or Mussolini in Italy. Um, and by March, March of 1937, an estimated 67% of the US public, according to the Gallup polls, said that the sit-downs ought to be illegal. So that's all roughly, what, two-thirds uh, of the United States public is saying that this is not anything any working class person should be involved with. So hostile to the sit-down was the public that the United Automobile Workers Union begins to walk back their support for what was their most potent weapon in the workplace, the sit-down strike. And by April, in May and June of 1937, the union is calling for an outright end to the sit-downs because everyone is, who is a union supporter is being looked upon, as they said, um, a walking strike waiting to happen. And there are also consequences for this at the ballot box. Um, there is a rightward swing um, in, as far as the political moment in the United States because of the sit-downs in 1937. Um, the Republican candidate for Detroit's mayor, uh, running against a UAW-backed Democratic candidate, absolutely crushes the UAW-backed candidate, and Richard Redding won um, the, the mayoral office in November 1937. One year later, in 1938, um, the Republican candidate for governor, Frank Fitzgerald, who had lost the governor's race in 1936 to Frank Murphy, um, does him one better and wins the November 1938 um, election for the governor's mansion. And Frank Murphy even lost approximately 12% of his support um, in Genesee County, which was where the Flint sit-down strikes had occurred. The Republicans won governorships in 13 uh, states in 1938, and these were centered in industrial states where the sit-down strikes were common. Uh, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, of course, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Rhode Island. Uh, so in the era of the Committee of Industrial Organization upsurge during 1936 and 1937, this translated ultimately into a powerful national backlash um, against this labor upsurge, against the Democrats that seemed to support them, and against those workers who um, marched as Mary Heaton Vorse, the labor journalist said, in labor's new millions during the 1930s. Um, so the conclusion, uh, what happens is ultimately, I think GM wins the argument. Um, certainly the United Automobile Workers wins the sit-down strike on February 11th. The company capitulated to the UAW. Um, the UAW was given um, a beachhead of sorts where the, the company vowed not to interfere with their organizing efforts, as I recall, for the next three months. Um, but ultimately, even though the company is forced to accept union um, uh, collective bargaining in the shop, they, in many ways, win the war. Um, the UAW is ultimately defanged uh, by this process, um, forced to become less of a social movement and more of a bureaucratic entity um, that would um, negotiate with the company rather than strike against the company. And everyone, thank you so much for tuning in and thank you all for attending. And I think we have time for questions, comments.
In this period, yes. Um, though what emerges later is uh, the clothes shop, where really uh, workers who come to work for General Motors as part of their employment, they are in the union and paying dues. So it becomes compulsory in a way what was called the clothes shop later. But in this early period, even the union is very frustrated that they've won the strike, but how do they get people to pay dues? Um, and the UAW is frequently complaining so much about these people who are um, kind of riding someone else's coattails, those good union workers who pay their dues. And, um, so the, it is voluntary in this earliest phase. So even though that didn't deal with the, the, the non-unionists were supported, or that movement was supported just by Jeff Jones. They were very heatedly made fun of, yes, but, by the union. Indeed, my, my point would be that even if much of, for example, the Flint Alliance was fakery, that there is a significant amount of substance. And what I think it illustrates is the UAW didn't necessarily control what was auto workers' opinions writ large. Um, the UAW, in fact, um, if, if we think about the concrete pieces of evidence, like who's a member, so something like less than 10% of uh, GM auto workers in Flint were UAW members at the time of the sit down, even though that number had started to come, come up at the end of 36. Um, what is more of the norm is so many more are not active union supporters. And even within these fake demonstrations, workers are in various ways expressing their own antipathy to the UAW. Um, what I was impressed by was you, you can go into the daily newspapers like in Detroit and Flint and people who identify themselves as GM workers from Flint and elsewhere, they're writing in to say, I don't want anything to do with the sit down business. I think this is communism and we shouldn't be communists if we're going to have a union. So there are those expressions of there are workers who don't like this union upsurge. They feel that seizing the company's property is somehow a kind of um, it, less a political statement and more of an outright property crime. And so the, the union doesn't, I think, control necessarily what, how a lot of auto workers felt about it. because they're the most adversely affected. Um, the, the GM workers in Flint, they, they were certainly not thrilled about the company in, in 1936 for a lot of reasons. Um, the heavy handedness of the way GM's managers behaved. Um, workers resented the fact that there are a lot of snitches in the ranks. And so if they talked even about their personal views, it was gonna get them in trouble. They didn't like the various kinds of favors bosses demanded to be able to get ships in the plant. Um, so in Flint, um, you have uh, probably the most amount of criticism of the company, but that didn't necessarily always mean they loved the UAW. Um, but the further out, out of Flint you get, because GM is this integrated national system. So if the bodies are made at Fisher Body in Flint, they're being assembled down at plants in Detroit or beyond. So with the choke point of Flint shut down, then everyone else is laid off elsewhere very quickly in a matter of days. And they're the ones who are very resentful that in a way Flint made this decision for everybody. Because there, there were a lot of people who weren't certain that it was the right time to strike the company or that they were comfortable with the UAW. There was a lot of workers who wanted American Federation of Labor Unions in there, which were politically more conservative, um, more favoring of skilled workers, and less, um, far less supportive of kind of militancy in the shop. 
Yes, I, I, I would want to go back and double check. But by 1938 and 1939, the company is um, allowing the union to have a kind of dues check off uh, in the shop. So if you go to work, your, your pay is deducted for the union. But in 1937, the union's greatest frustration is they can't make people pay their dues even if they say they're a member. So was that, was that just one of the concessions that the company made? Yeah. To kind of come up with a working relationship with the, the union? Somewhat. Um, GM's policy, though, is for the big three is the most antagonistic uh, toward the union long term. Uh, relations are going to be sour between the UAW and General Motors for decades to come. Um, even after Henry Ford ultimately dies and the Ford Service Department under Harry Bennett is disbanded and, and all that is done away with, things improved at Ford. Things would improve at Chrysler. But General Motors had this kind of policy of non-support and practically non-cooperation. And GM held on to the right to manage, so how fast the machines would go, you know, what would be the work people did. And in fact, GM is so smart, they, they essentially compel the union, if you're going to be here, you're going to kind of be uh, making sure your members go along with the contract. Okay, so it was uh, kind of... They were very savvy about how they dealt with the UAW. Yeah. And the UAW, after the, they win the Flint sit-down, there are occasionally these things in General Motors where there are these wildcat strikes, these sudden, unplanned, unannounced walkouts. And um, the company goes to the union and says, what are you going to do here? Put your members back in the shop. And the UAW essentially feels like they have to go along with this because the court of public opinion out there is against them. The UAW is existing for most of 37 into 38 and 39 in a real precarious position especially with GM. They don't have the organization of Ford completed until 41. So they're kind of operating on a shoestring in a precarious position, even though they've defeated the greatest company in the world and the biggest company in the United States, excuse me, um, you know, on February 11th, 1937. GM may well have made an important move by Ford. Very. Um, unfortunately, no. That, that's another thing um, that remains part of the, the union records and in grievances all the way into the 60s, as I've read, um, is that the GM plants were um, incredibly archaic in terms of the machines there. Um, they're still using machines from the 20s and 30s and in the 60s. Um, people still lose fingers. Um, people still get hands crushed in these um, archaic machines. Um, they're dirty, grimy, filthy, um, inhospitable places, um, cold in winter, brutally hot in summer. Um, it's something that um, workers are grieving and complaining about and talking about for decades uh, after the sit downs. So, you mean, you mean workers are, are being attacked the company back and forth, both by the GMC at the time or some of the other uh, workers are activists? Um, that would be a good question. Um, there are cases of, um, a lot of cases of workers transitioning to supervision, uh, as it was called, so becoming um, foremen, moving into kind of what would be managerial um, jobs, um, a couple of which um, graduating to white collars uh, as a result of that. Um, but the great majority of these auto workers in, in GM, at GM would put in long careers as unionized auto workers and would be retiring um, by the 1960s, 1970s at the latest. Um, a lot of my, some of my principal sources were oral histories that were done in the 70s. And um, these couple of historians who did this very heavy lifting of interviewing maybe a couple hundred auto workers, these folks had retired in the early 60s by and large. They were very much in the twilight of their lives when they're being interviewed in 78. 
Uh, yeah. Um, one of my favorite um, documents of that is an autobiography um, written by a former Flint auto worker named Ben Hamper. And he writes a book called Rivet Head um, in the 90s, as I recall. And his whole point was, he, he uses the term shop rat to talk about these folks who worked at GM, and that there's a kind of generational pull. And even though Ben Hamper, as a young person, um, had some idea that he wasn't gonna end up like his father and work at the GM plant. Nonetheless, real life beckoned and he's an auto worker like his father. Um, and he begins his book with a kind of lament about there's, there's a certain inevitability to it. And so indeed, um, in very working class communities like Flint or even maybe in the coal mining areas of West Virginia, uh, sons followed their fathers into the plant. There was that, yeah. All right, well, everybody, thank you again so much um, for the invitation to speak today. This was a, a, a real uh, pleasant evening. Um, I love to be able to come and talk about um, anything and everything to do with labor history. So this was a really good night. So thank you very much for tuning in and for attending. Thank you.